Starting on this last new moon, the new moon in Sagittarius, I felt like I was on the cusp of something really important. And I've been writing and wrestling with it for the last week or so. Um, I mean, really, I've been writing and wrestling with it for many, many years. And it's just that everything is kind of coming together in a new way now. So I really wanted to sum up everything that I've been thinking about and all the changes I've made over the past few weeks. Uh, not even just sum it up, but like write it all down. Um, document every single change in process and major thing that's been making me think. And I need to accept that's not going to happen. <laughs> because while I do have a lot of notes and things, it's just never going to fully capture every thought that I've had. Um, and even the process of writing has been changing my thoughts anyway. But I feel like I have gone through a pretty significant development, and so I want to be able to at least preserve some pieces of my process. Um, so this, I'm going to be doing my best here to paint some very broad strokes. And trust me, they may not look that broad, but this is nothing compared to everything that's been going on in my head. Um, so that's basically what this video is going to be about. Uh, there's not really going to be any visuals. All of this here is just for the sake of having something pretty to look at while I talk, because there's a lot that I have to say. Um, I sort of, I actually have it sort of scripted out, which I rarely script anything, but this, you'll see why I needed to do that in a minute. Um, but yeah, I hope that you enjoy this uh, tale of philosophy, exploration, and personal development, and magic. First, for a little bit of background, the major thing that I've been thinking about is a resurgence of something that I've been struggling with for basically eight years now since my dad died. And uh, that is figuring out my relationship with spirituality. And this is a theme that's even present in my astrological chart, uh, balancing skepticism with an interest in mysticism and art. And this month in particular, I had a lot of spare time. I mean, a lot, because I intentionally took the semester off and took some time off work in anticipation of some difficult depression feelings surrounding grief about my dad's November death. Um, and those definitely happened, but they weren't as debilitating as I thought they might be. Which is good, but it has also left me with a lot of free time, and my brain had been prepared to tackle some un unacknowledged things, no matter how scary or complicated or overwhelming, and so now it was itching to do it. And when playing Animal Crossing all day was starting to feel like a distraction, then I finally took a lot of time to sit down and think and write out some stuff. Here's the thing. For the last few years, I have been exploring a lot of things related to spirituality, but relatively little doing of it. Um, although I was motivated to learn about it, and although I thought I had a desire for actually building a practice and defining some of my beliefs, I just never did. And I certainly tried defining some of my beliefs and writing down theories about magic and spirituality. I followed outlines for building an authentic spiritual or witchcraft practice from multiple books and YouTube videos. I got lots of advice from friends, therapists, spiritual mentors, tarot cards, and I gave myself even more advice. But just setting up something whether it would change or not, whether it was complex and ritualized or simple and folksy, whether it was a daily routine or observation of the holidays or involved this or that or the other thing, it just never happened, despite many, many well-laid plans. And I think it's because in the back of my head, I knew that there was something I had to figure out before I'd be able to get over that hump. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> and... I think that the hump was something fundamental with the concept of spirituality or um, how I was approaching it. So this is when I started laying shit out. What I ended up doing first to start parsing all of this was make lists. I started by trying to make a list of my current beliefs and non-beliefs, but that didn't really go anywhere. What did crack things open was making a list of stuff I'm interested in 
that I would put in the category of spirituality or somehow related to spirituality. Um, and I knew that certainly all of these things could be explored without being spirituality, but maybe there was something that they had in common or maybe having all of them laid out could give me some idea of the feeling that I was getting from them. And because you're probably as curious about that list as future me will be reading list, then um, I'll just be reading off my unedited list here. <laughs> Things I'm interested in. Alchemy, the process of transformation and transformation by process. The idea of something occurring as being significant even if the outcome isn't visible. Multiplying by one, etc. Metaphysics, <laughs> the structure of the universe, if there is one and especially the implications of alternative metaphysical models on how we can know things that are otherwise unexplainable. Um, for example, divination. Uh, models of time are especially interesting. I like eternalism and the possibility of timelessness. Understanding the flaws in our senses, like the allegory of the cave, how our brains try to understand things as being different from how they are outside of us animals. <laughs> the life of animals and how they experience seasons and uh, natural behaviors as well as symbolism and depictions of animals by us. Alpine paganism. <laughs> Cultural traditions and folklore and mythology from the region that my family's from. Art, both as a process, a creation, and how we use symbolism. Art is an attempt at alchemizing transpersonal moments or moments beyond ourselves into something more clear, distilled, and practical, meaning visible by our senses. Art as magic, bringing about a feeling, and magic as art, self-expression through performance or existence. The idea that magic and art are ultimately the same thing. I haven't fully developed that idea into something easily explainable, but it comes up a lot for me. Use of symbolism and playing with symbolism in general. Number symbolism, astrology and tarot, animals. Werewolves are a really potent symbol for me. Um, and also the idea of naming as being a very important power that humans have. Naming and using words and language to declare a special type of value and understanding and appreciation. Uh, regional difference in generally accepted complete symbols. Basically, for example, China uses five elements. So why does the West declare four to be the sum of elements on Earth? Fire, air, earth, water. How would Western purists account for Chinese elements? Interested in the cultural appropriation and assertion aspects, I'm interested in the differences and also possible synergies between them. So that was my list. <laughs> this list ended up being incomplete. But these are a lot of the major things I'm interested in that I'm referring to in my head when I think about spirituality. And I think the thing they have in common is that I don't think I could fully understand any of these things just by learning about them as I would learn about math or English or whatever. There is an aspect of deeper thought, really digging down to myself. And this spawned another list, which also ended up being incomplete about what I wanted to get out of a spiritual practice. A lot of the books that I've read and advice that I'd heard suggested this step, which I had never actually done in earnest. I don't know how relevant it has ended up being yet, but for the sake of posterity, I'm just going to read off that list too. Um, that list was what I want to get out of this. Feeling supported in my beliefs rather than constantly feeling the need to justify or defend them to myself. Feeling artistically inspired, making more occult zines, having enough depth of symbolic knowledge and exploration to apply it to artwork. Curiosity and uncertainty as a motivating force instead of a petrifying one. Uh, basically, I want to wrestle with things. I want to feel how I feel when I'm working on my occult zines or taking notes on something I love reading. Uh, something that gets my spark back when I need it, something that I can think about deeply when I'm depressed, like metaphysics, something that strengthens my connection with my dad, um, and I want to be able to initiate that feeling of transpersonalism intentionally. Um, 
I don't really get into transpersonalism here, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the next thing I had to do was to really look at the word spirituality. Because honestly, I was incredibly uncomfortable with it. I had sort of guessed that my discomfort was because, um, oh, I had considered spirituality and logic and science to be incompatible for a long time, and just assumed that I had to ignore the discomfort and get over myself. But the thing is, I had never really examined why I felt they were incompatible, or why I was comfortable with one spiritual, or I'm comfortable with logic and science, but not the other, spirituality. And so I actually had to look at that discomfort and try to parse it out. So although I thought I wanted a spiritual practice, if someone were to ask me to describe my spiritual practice or, or what I wanted by it, I'd feel sort of uneasy. And I would always start by saying, I don't really have one, but I guess here's a few things I do, like tarot, or a few things I'm interested in, like the entire above list, that some other people would call spiritual, but I would never use the word to describe myself. And that's not inherently a bad thing. But the discomfort I was feeling wasn't coming from a place of me thinking, eh, that word just doesn't sound right, but it was kind of from a place of fear. Uh, it was an intentional effort to distance myself from the realm of spirituality. And I instead referred to my relationship with spirituality as an interest. But I think it's kind of clear that if I kept craving what I was thinking of as a spiritual practice, despite my discomfort with the word, it meant that interest wasn't a comprehensive enough word to me. Something being just an interest wasn't a bad thing by any means. Uh, there are plenty of things that I'm interested in where I feel completely satisfied and fulfilled with just learning about them. But the word interest didn't capture that mysterious, deeper thought integration of the self aspect that united the things on my list. So the question, of course, <laughs> became that if interest wasn't comprehensive enough of a word, why was I using it? And I think it's because the word interest feels like it's in the intellectual realm in a distancing way. Having an interest is neutral, it's non-committal, and in that way it's somewhat more protective and almost secretive. I can say to others, but mostly to myself, that I just have an interest in spirituality as a way of ignoring the other parts of my relationship to it, which are scary and unknown and feel more serious. Uh, the next part happened <laughs> when I finally watched an Anorga, sorry if I, I pronounced that wrong, uh, Anorga vi video that I had been putting off for a long time. I'll link it below, but it was called Why Spirituality is Important. I had been putting it off because my inner punk hisses at the idea that anything is universally important, or that I need to do anything in order to be a fulfilled human. And of course, that's really not what she was saying, but this is a somewhat common view among New Age people, that however it's fulfilled, everyone does or needs to have some sense of spirituality. For example, people might say that for some, spirituality isn't God, but the sense of wonder at the universe, and even atheists have or need that sense of spirituality. And I always took issue with this view because I didn't like people referring to my beliefs as though they were spiritual ones when I didn't see them that way. Like I said in my list, naming is a super important power, and I'm the one who gets to decide uh, whether my beliefs are spiritual or non-spiritual. I'm the one who gets to name them, name my beliefs, name my way of being. Not you, random, <laughs> hypothetical, new age person. Uh, but I digress. The part of the video that really grabbed my attention was a somewhat random phrase that she said about the role spirituality can sometimes fill. And the line was, spirituality is like an embodied philosophy. And I think, hey, philosophy? I like philosophy. <laughs> um, and the line really got me thinking, because I find that philosophy, similar to many of the things on my interest list, involves a deeper different sort of thought than many other subjects. And it started me on this path of thinking about the relationship between spirituality and philosophy. 
Is spirituality just an aspect of philosophy? Does philosophy form the underpinnings of spirituality in the way that metaphysics forms the underpinning of science? Uh, what is the difference between spirituality and philosophy, and what do they have in common? So, <laughs> the next part here is a little funny, and I'm not sure how much detail to go into, <laughs> but basically, I had what I thought would be a big breakthrough. The thing that would help me figure it all out and get over my issue with the word spirituality. And I wrote this big essay, thousands of words long, with the intention of using it as a video script to describe how I've grown and developed much like this one, how I was getting more comfortable with the word spirituality, how an alternative approach to the concept of spirituality would look, blah blah blah. And I'd almost finished it, and I decided to share it with my partner. And then after a long, very lovely, very friendly uh, philosophical conversation with him, I realized, wait, Maybe this doesn't sound right. And I think, shit, <laughs> now what am I going to do with all this stuff I spent the last six hours on? <laughs> um, looking back on it now, I do believe that whole process was necessary for what would happen next. But at the time, I was definitely feeling defeated and exhausted after all that. Like, I had done all that work and ended up basically where I started. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize my initial thought process essay here, but I won't include all of the examples and arguments and big long reasoning parts that, you know, I had in the original essay. My thought was that I was uncomfortable with the word spirituality because it felt like it required or implied a certain commitment that the word interest didn't. And what I thought that commitment might be is some type of belief. Interest doesn't suggest that you believe in anything, while spirituality kind of does. If that's the case, then what is it that you are believing? And I figured it meant that you believed in something non or not exclusively scientific, or else it would just be a quote-unquote belief in science. Um, it also wouldn't be exclusively ethics or politics, or else, again, it wouldn't be spirituality, it'd just be ethics or politics. So what made something spiritual was that it was explaining something something we couldn't otherwise explain, which would make it metaphysics. Um, but the difference between spirituality and philosophy then was the commitment aspect. So basically on this model, spirituality was a commitment to and belief in a certain metaphysical worldview some sort of beliefs about the way the universe is constructed, whether that's the idea of a central source or creator deities, or a cyclical universe, or energies, or synchronicity, or life after death, or the distinct lack of life after death. Um, any, any of, it would be a commitment to any one of those sorts of beliefs. Or someone might be agnostic, but that still means decidedly ascribing to a belief. Uh, that being the belief that we can't know certain things. And then spiritual practice is basically acting on that belief. Um, as one practical example, <laughs> if someone says they are doing ancestor work in the context of spiritual practice, that seems like it would imply that they are doing something based on their commitment to a metaphysical belief. Namely, the belief that it is at least possible that one could have a special connection with their deceased ancestors. And the thing that made me uncomfortable about spirituality, at least on that model, is that I don't want to commit to any metaphysical view, including agnosticism. Uh, this is why I call myself an atheist, incidentally, instead of agnostic. I know that people's definitions will vary, but to me, agnosticism means a commitment to the idea that we can't know certain things. I don't think that we can't know certain metaphysical things. I think we don't know certain metaphysical things. And atheism, to me, is being uncommitted to certain metaphysical things due to a lack of personally compelling evidence or reasoning. Um, but anyway. Then, um, I started to question whether this reasoning that uh, spirituality is a commitment to a metaphysical view was actually sound. And I considered that maybe spirituality doesn't require belief in anything, or even a commitment to certain ideas. And um, I was instead considering an approach where spirituality, like philosophy for me, 
could instead be a means of exploring multiple ideas distinctly without commitment. So then the question is, if philosophy and spirituality could both be exploring multiple ideas without a commitment to any one answer, then what is the difference between them? And my very broad answer to this very broad question um, was that spirituality and philosophy are each really good at exploring different kinds of things. Uh, philosophy is very good at exploring certain ideas, while spirituality is really good at exploring certain feelings. Those feelings like feelings of harmony, feelings of identity, feelings of connection, feelings uh, about death, and most notably, feelings of transpersonalism, or being personally connected with something outside of yourself. And doing spirituality, then, is engaging with those feelings as directly as possible, exploring, expanding, and strengthening your repertoire of complex feelings or extrasensory sensations. And in that way, a spiritual practice would be, quite simply, practicing those feelings and sensing those sensations. So this model of spirituality, that's what I thought the big breakthrough would be. But it's only a model, <laughs> and I definitely think that it's interesting, and it's something I want to keep thinking about. But what I realized while talking with my partner is that it's built upon the idea of not requiring belief in something in order to work. And while I think that's really nice for a model that's more universally applicable, it doesn't entirely address my personal problem. Uh, so I'll just, I'll talk about uh, what I was talking about with my partner. Basically, when I was talking with my partner, we were mostly talking about whether it's possible to neither believe nor disbelieve something. Uh, his general view was that belief is a binary state. Either you believe something or you don't. There isn't really a both slash neither option. My general view was that there is a both slash neither option, and this model of spirituality basically allows you to stay in that place of neither believing nor disbelieving indefinitely, while still doing actions that might, to an outside observer, imply that you believe in something. Um, and his thought was that while there isn't a both slash neither option, it might look like there is um, when we look at things overall. So basically, on Sean's view, your status of belief or disbelief changes. And it can change frequently, perhaps even without you fully realizing or accepting it. And when you're seeing belief as both slash neither, one of a few things could be happening. One possibility is that you only believe certain aspects of what you say you believe, and belief you're looking at isn't specific enough. Another possibility is that you're seeing belief as fixed, and therefore you are hesitant to recognize your status as belief or disbelief because you're operating on the idea that doing so somehow means it won't change, or that it's more significant when it does change, which isn't necessarily true. Another possibility is that you're trying to account for both instances of belief and disbelief at the same time. So basically, you're saying, I both believe and disbelieve, or I neither believe nor disbelieve, when what's really happening is that in one moment you believe something, and the next moment you disbelieve it. So it's sort of like if you had two lights flashing between each other so quickly that it looks like they're both always on, when really the lights are never both on at the same time. Um, so you're sort of flashing between states of belief and disbelief so that it looks like it's both when really it's switching back and forth. Um, and another possibility is that due to some sort of pressure, whether external or internal, you haven't fully acknowledged your belief status. Uh, if you were to drill down and take away the layers of societal expectations, the layers of feelings of guilt or shame, and any efforts to find a justification for your belief or disbelief, you would be able to find rather clearly that you believe or disbelieve. 
And trying to say that there is a both slash neither option is basically you trying to accommodate these extra layers of pressure. I found Sean's approach very compelling. I don't think that accepting a binary state of belief means that my model of spirituality wouldn't work. Uh, whether you believe in a metaphysical statement or not, spirituality could still be seen as a means of exploring feeling. But it was clear to me that if I felt a belief was something to be committed to, rather than just a binary statement of fact, then of course I wouldn't want to say I believe in something or disbelieve in something without, uh, you know, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of effort uh, and a lot of thought, because the statement... Um, takes on so much weight and it's absolutely influenced by these layers of pressure from internal and external expectations and implications and all that stuff. So this conversation made me realize that maybe my problem wasn't really with what spirituality was, it was with what belief was. My redefining spirituality to not require belief was an effort to separate the two. And just how I use the word interest to avoid grappling with the word spirituality, I was using this model of spirituality to avoid grappling with belief. <laughs> so this is what I mean of feeling very overwhelmed after it and very somewhat very defeated. Um, the central lesson that I'm working hard on accepting is that belief is not a bad thing. Belief or disbelief as a state of being does not have an inherent moral value. Belief on its own doesn't mean a commitment to anything, whether that be certain actions or certain thoughts or whatever. Now, <laughs> I want to be super clear. Belief as we typically think of it can and does influence thoughts and actions. But, a lot of what we think of as belief isn't exactly belief, but a commitment to a certain idea. So let's take as an example the statement, I believe gay people are evil. That obviously does influence actions. Someone who makes that statement is very likely to act on that statement in particular ways, such as voting against gay rights legislation or even enacting violence. But looking at that statement, I think we need to ask ourselves, is that statement an honest, objective reflection of the status of their belief at that given moment, as we've, as we've defined belief as a binary state? Or is it more of a statement of their commitment to a belief? Is it really more a reflection of those layers of pressure that obscure their belief status, the layers of social expectations, thoughts on ethics, guilt and shame and fear and etc. And I think that statements of any kind are very rarely, if ever, reflecting the most objective true feeling, because statements are always influenced by how we think, how we want to appear, uh, and by our society. There is a lot, 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 lot of meat there. <laughs> and there are so many different views on what belief is, whether it truly can be something separate from thought and action, whether it is indeed a binary status or not. And so this isn't something that can be like distinctly summed up here or probably anywhere. Um, but my point as it relates to spirituality, and specifically my relationship with spirituality, is that it's important for me to accept that belief on its own doesn't automatically imply anything else. Because accepting that takes, off, takes a lot of the pressure off that I'm feeling about justifying certain beliefs. Um, it allows me to be more honest with myself about what I believe because I'm approaching it without the layers of guilt and shame and expectations and rationality and whatever might else be influencing it. And I think being really and deeply honest with myself without beating myself up is what I need right now. So <laughs> going back to the beginning a little, by this point, <laughs> by this point in my exploration, I have detangled quite a lot of stuff. 
Um, but I'm still left with my central question. The thing that I've been trying to figure out this whole time, what do I mean when I say that I want a spiritual practice? And what is it, and, and is it, what, okay, <laughs> let me, let me start that sentence over. What do I mean when I say that I want a spiritual practice? And is what I want indeed a spiritual practice? Or is it something else that I want? I'm going to take a little sip of water here. Okay. <clears throat> so, you can kind of picture where I was at this point. <laughs> I'm completely surrounded by all of these ideas and discussions and research and thought trails, frankly, not just from the last couple of weeks, from the last many years as I've been exploring and thinking about all this in earnest. And I'm looking around and thinking like, man, how have I done all of this work and still feel so trapped and confused? And I tried to settle my thoughts a little bit with a tarot reading. No particular direction or anything, just a tarot reading. And I ended up pulling two cards from the Heart Spun Tarot, which I have here just for visual reference. The Eight of Swords and the Three of Cups. In the Eight, we have a trapped deer. And in the Three, we have these wolves with a lot of imagery of success and abundance. You have all these gourds and this laurel and all this stuff. And when you think about it, these images are each kind of describing the same situation. When a wolf corners a deer, when wolves corner a deer, um, for the deer it means death, and for the wolves it means life. And so to the wolves it's a good thing, and to the deer it's a bad thing. And this, whole, this just juxtaposition, I guess, these two cards um, next to each other really made me think a lot about perspective. And so that's kind of where my next trail was. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and set these, set these aside. So maybe my current situation of being surrounded by all of these ideas and all of these notes and whatnot isn't really a sign of work, but a sign of play. Maybe getting tangled in these messy ideas is a good thing, because it means that, for one, I've thought and engaged enough to get somewhere, even if that somewhere isn't a particular conclusion. And for two, I care enough about the topics that I'm willing to get really messy with them. And it's sort of like, if I were to see a kid covered in paint and glitter, my immediate reaction is, looks like someone had a good time. And so here I am, in my half-finished philosophy notes and essays that seemed right but quickly broke apart and dozens of books and piles and piles of ideas and directions. And maybe the response then should be, looks like someone had a good time. <laughs> and maybe the specifics, the outcomes, and whether it's spirituality or philosophy, maybe that just doesn't matter to me. Philosophy and spirituality really are similar in that they can both be immensely frustrating, but they are so fascinating and rewarding that just to engage at all is a worthy activity. And so looking back on how I was analyzing the meaning of the word spirituality, I was really caught up in the idea that belief plays some important role, and I was trying to get away from that role. And I was caught up in that because I saw belief as being some big commitment. But if it's not a commitment, and if it's instead just a neutral, factual statement of status, then it seems like whether you believe or not is sort of secondary. Um, so maybe it's also the case that whether you're doing spirituality or not is also secondary. If you're doing the same action, then what does it really matter whether you're doing it because you believe? than versus because you've grown to like the ritual or any other reason. And if your belief can change, and perhaps even change moment to moment, then why bother labeling it as spirituality or not spirituality? Labels may feel more or less necessary at different points in time, but if I were to zoom back and look at the whole picture and ask myself, okay, so was all this spirituality or not? then the answer is always going to be arbitrary, because there will be some moments that the answer, whether yes or no, 
will describe accurately, and some moments that the answer doesn't fully reflect. Whether it was my actual belief status, or simply my perspective of my actions that changed, any answer is going to be missing that element of change itself. So, <laughs> I wrote a bunch of this down, and I was feeling pretty good. Like, I had achieved some sense of uh, what I can only describe as post-thought clarity. <laughs> and I decided to take a shower, which I had been putting off since I had been so focused on working on all this stuff. And like all of life's greatest thoughts, <laughs> I had an incredible idea in the shower. And I came out of that shower feeling so essentially myself and completely enlightened and unburdened and confident and in tune with everything around me. And I knew I had hit that missing piece that brought everything together for me. So let's talk about that. <laughs> One thing that always has been important to me and will continually be important for me is naming. Um, so on the topic of labels, I know that a lot of people can feel very limited by them. And for me, finding the right word or words to describe my experience is tremendously valuable. Uh, it's like looking through a mirror with one eye and a telescope with the other, where you're seeing myself and everything around me and suddenly just feeling like so many more things are possible because I have a name. And so even if I have reached the conclusion that it doesn't matter if what I'm doing is spirituality or not, I'd still like to have a name for what it is that I'm doing. Something that I can refer to casually, something that feels accurate and comprehensive and reflective of myself. And so since I was feeling pretty good, I asked myself, okay, so how would I describe what I'm feeling right now in this post-thought clarity? What is the unifying thing that I can use to describe these feelings of bliss or control or clarity or confidence or whatever it is that I've arrived at after all of this possibly spiritual, possibly philosophical enlightenment? Well, why not magic? Of course, <laughs> magic. <laughs> That's what this feels like, magic. And if what I'm doing is chasing and using magic, then that's witchcraft. And that makes me a witch. <laughs> and as soon as that entered my head, everything clicked. I had my big, shiny eureka moment. Angels descended from the rafters. All of that shit. My eureka song started playing in my head. The song that always seems to pop up when I have a eureka moment is I'm a Boy by The Who probably in no small part due to its, like, <laughs> trans implications. But anyway, I was just, I, it, everything just made sense. I wanted to run out of the shower and scream and sprint and run and collapse in a big field of flowers. I was so thrilled and happy and confident, and it really did feel like when I realized I wanted to be called Wesley, and I suddenly felt at place in the world. And so at least for now, and at least for a while, everything makes sense. I'm a witch. That's what I'm doing with all of this. When I'm thinking or feeling or philosophizing or spiritualizing or making art that really feels like me or engaging with any of those things that were on my big list before, I'm doing magic. And if it all changes and I feel differently, I suddenly don't care <laughs> because change is magic too and my witchcraft is embracing that confidence and curiosity and stubbornness and fun and deadly seriousness and just every single thing that's been encompassed by all of these mysteriously powerful tangled explorations that leave me in this big pile at the end that's my witchcraft and really, this shower, <laughs> and, and just right now, is really the first time that I've ever really felt it. I am a witch. And this whole process over the last few weeks felt like my final test 
to see if I would give up when I sorted through all of these tangled brambles and thought that they made sense, but realized that no matter how I arrange them, they're still brambles. And that um, process put me in that floaty, open place of clarity um, during which I entered the shower. And getting in the shower was itself the the final necessary act of not only this devoted commitment to thought and truth and exploration and all the stuff that I had done, but also to myself. And that shower is what sealed it. That running water became my initiation ritual. I entered that shower as an unnamed being, and I came out with the title of witch. I have graduated. I have begun, I have seized my power and knowledge and entered a new phase of identity. So, that's the story. <laughs> that is how I became a witch. And of course, there's a lot more story to go, but for now, that is the end, and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.